Okay, I think I'm in business, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, well, thanks, Gims. Okay, the watch, yeah, 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 yeah. Make sure I put it the right way up, otherwise it'll be here forever. Okay. And first of all, I've been lecturing for far too long to realize that you don't keep delegates away from the cover. So I will try to keep my lecture very short. And um, also, I will, uh, having uh, heard Eugenio's lecture now, I will obviously try to modify my lecture as we go along. Okay, this is um, Swansea, of course. And what I want to do first is give a brief personal review of computational plasticity and development in general. But the important thing, I want to emph emphasize the industrial aspects because a lot of the problems, almost every problem I'm solving, is that okay? Because uh, all the problems you solve, it's okay, is it? Yeah, okay. Uh, the problem is often I've been solving have been based on what I've been doing in the commercial setting, and therefore all the problems are, are real world problems. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about current progress very quickly, what, where we are at the moment, continuum modeling, discrete element modeling, and multi-physics problems. And then I'd like to deal with future prospects, in particular, what are the challenges that we're facing this century, and also, I'd like to make a case for the need for blue sky research. And then finish off, I'd like to uh, mention very briefly the relationship between Swansea and Simney, but this has already been very well covered by, by Eugenio. Well, Eugenio originally asked me to talk about computational plasticity, so I didn't really know what I was going to talk about. So the first thing I did was I looked at the uh, brochure for the conference, and these are the topics that uh, uh, appear in the brochure. And then if you can sort these out, you realize that these can be categorized as... Um, go away. Categorized as five different topics, basically, that advances in new materials, multi-scale, multi-physics analysis, etc., computational issues for very large-scale problems, high-performance computing. Then you need supporting technology for these problems, for many of them, mesh adaptivity, something that's essential for finite strain plasticity problems. Element technology, again, we have to deal with incompressibility and uh, other areas we need to deal with are the problems of contact. Also, there are new research fields which are really plasticity because they are uh, non-reversible. And we have, in this area, we have particle methods and multi-fracturing solids. And, of course, new applications of the field of bio, nano, etc. Um, very quickly, this is, to set the starting point, the origins of the finite element methods, we can say it very quickly, started off basically in the 1940s when uh, it was recognized that aircraft structures were, wings were, and fuselages were being clad in aluminium, and therefore you could actually use this to carry stress. And therefore we had Renikoff and also McHenry who said that um, you can actually maybe solve these sheet problems by using fr uh, a framework analogy. And on the, but at the same time, Courant on the East Coast, this was on the West Coast of the States, the, on the East Coast, we found that Courant was doing a similar thing, solving torsion problems by dividing regions into triangles. And uh, very little happened for the next decade, largely because of the absence of computing power. And then in 1956, we come along with the first um, recognizable finite element paper, and this was the famous paper of Turner, Clough, Martin, and Top. But it was only four years later that the word finite element was first used, and this was Ray Clough coined the word finite element in a conference paper in 1960. So at this stage, what we have here is uh, the fact that we, linear finite element methods are now well established. There's a large body of research already been undertaken before moving on to uh, uh, nonlinear problems. Computational plasticity really started in the mid to late 1960s where we began actually producing some solution, but the linearization procedures that we use are very ad hoc, that we um, just followed intuition, if you like, to actually uh, linearize a problem. And, uh, but even at that stage, you can demonstrate that the computational solutions were really beneficial. This is an example. This is a problem solved in 1970. 
where we looked at uh, the bending of a beam and, uh, with, a, with a notch in it. And we solved this by finite element method. And first of all, what you see is that the Henke solution, this is the Tresca eel criterion without any hardening, was considered to be the exact solution for this problem. And the, unfortunately, the theoretical solution was based on the assumption that the through thickness stress was always intermediate. And we solved this problem using, as you can see, uh, isoparametric elements. And uh, if you look at the stress distribution below the notch root, this is the no notch root here, and if you look below that notch root, and if you look at the stress distribution along there, what you find is that the Henke solution, the theoretical solution, and the finite element solution agree very well up to a certain point. And then they diverge. And they diverge at the point where the through thickness stress, sigma z, no longer is intermediate. In fact, it becomes a minimum principal stress. So the condition of the Henke solution is violated. And uh, it in means, in fact, that is, uh, the finite element solution is the correct solution to this problem. So you can always argue that this is an example of the third pillar of scientific progress, if you like, that this numerical solution has provided information which you could not get from experiment and you could also not get from an analytical solution. So this is the very indi first indication that finite elements could provide information that you couldn't get by any other means. Um, and we continued solving problems on this basis for, for quite a while until a famous paper appeared in 1985 by uh, uh, Juan Simo and Bob Taylor, and this was the idea of the consistent linearization of problems. Um, I should also say in passing that Juan was a very um, great supporter of the complex series of problems. He, he came here for most of the, the conferences, and that was probably largely due to the fact he was Spanish in route, and uh, he was very much a, a keen contributor to this conference. And the idea of the consistent linearization was that you should use the, the, the tangent operator that the global, for the solution of the global problem, should also be consistent with that that you use for integration of the rate in the, uh, constitutive equations. And um, what you get from this, of course, is you get quadratic convergence, so that the problem is far more stable, and also you get improved robustness. The, the, the convergence, uh, the bowl of convergence increases and you can actually solve problems with far more rigor. But before you can actually solve these problems, there are other things you have to take into account. First of all, you need supporting technology because the deformation, the plastic deformation is isochoric and therefore we need elements that can cope with um, uh, incompressibility. And there are many ways of uh, enforcing incompressibility and the enhanced strain methods, F-bar methodology, and mixed UP formulations. Uh, I'll just v very briefly mention the F-bar method, which is one we developed from Swansea. And the whole idea is that you can actually solve this problem at the element level, at the stress calculation level, that the Cauchy stress can be, which you, can be expressed in terms of the um, deformation gradient and the internal variables. If you do a multiplicative split of the deformation gradient into a, an uh, isochoric and a volumetric part by actually calculating the isochoric part at the normal two by two integrating points and the volumetric part at the center point, and the same thing in 3D, then you can actually uh, uh, get over this problem. But one difficulty that you face is that you, for many of these problems, you want to use um, tetrahedral element or triangular elements uh, because either to capture intricate geometry or to um, uh, undertake a mesh adaptive solution. And the problem then, if you use linear tetrahedra, you've only got one integrating point, so you can't pull this trick. So what you can do is something similar that you can use the F-bar patch method where you actually impress the, the, do the volumetric uh, constraint on a patch of elements, not on an individual element. And uh, in this case, for, for 2D, you can do this with an asso association of just two elements. Uh, does it work? Well, the, this is the case of a rubber cylinder, which is squashed down to 40% of its original height. And if you just do the F-bar method with bilinear quadrilaterals, you find that the hydrostatics pressure contours are very well behaved, no problem whatsoever. 
And if you use the FBAR patch method using ordinary linear triangles, just uh, simple linear triangles associated in patches of two, again you get a very um, a nice regular behavior. Uh, but the benefits of the problem really comes in 3D when you solve problems using linear tetrahedra. This is a case of a, of a um, tension of a bar with necking. And you find even at this advanced stage that the, uh, pressure, uh, the pressure distribution is, uh, is, is very well behaved. And then if you look at the low deflection curve, you can, yes, you can see it there. So essentially, that is in either the F bar itself in an axisymmetric mode or using the F bar patch for this arrangement here, you get the same solution. And also, if you'd use the, the, just the linear element without any enhancement, you'd get this uh, overstiff response. So essentially speaking, we can actually uh, take care of incompressibility problems to, to obtain solutions. Um, then, when we go to finite strain elastoplasticity, uh, this, the idea of um, solving the um, last strain problems started in the early uh, 1950s, or the late 1950s, rather, with Hill, um, Nagti, and Green, and so on, and based on hypoelastic uh, formulations. And when these were embedded in a numerical setting, we found there was a lot of problems. Uh, initially, you got lack of objectivity of the constitutive laws, oscillatory stress distributions, and also you have dissipated behavior within the elastic range, which is obviously unacceptable. And uh, to overcome these, we found that the computational solution then uh, using hyper-elastic hyper formulations were well established by the early 1990s. And these hyper-elastic formulations overcame all these difficulties. And the essential ingredients are you've got a Henke logarithmic strain measures, multiplicative split to deformation gradient, and the other important one is the exponential map integrator of the plastic flow equations. So by the early 1990s, we could solve finite strain plasticity problems without any, any difficulty. And I'll show you a picture also now of Mike Crisfield here, because during this time, Mike Crisfield worked very closely with us, and also he was a great support of the Complas conferences. He came to every Complas conference until his death. And uh, I should also say, I remember at one occasion with Juan Simo and Mike Crisfield together, that um, Mike Crisfield was the chairman of a session starting at 9 o'clock in the morning, and Juan was the first uh, plenary lecturer. And um, Mike got onto the platform. He arrived at his, the the lecture was at 9 o'clock, and Mike had arrived home in, to the hotel at 8 o'clock, an hour earlier, having spent the evening on the Ramblas, and I know he had because I was with him, and, and uh, introduced the speaker, he introduced Juan, and he sat on the platform, and five minutes later, Mike was fast asleep. Now, normally, this isn't a problem for a chairman, but, um, but a member of the audience jumped up and said, stop the lecture, stop the lecture. This formulation is not objective. There is no point continuing with the lecture. And this was somebody called Turan Onat from Yale. And, um, and Mike did two amazing things. First of all, he actually woke up. And secondly, he actually, he, in his nice um, public school way, because Mike went to a public school, a famous public school, Halebury School, which is where Rudyard Kipling went to, and actually he said something of the event, that, something to the effect that um, it's usually would let the speaker have its say, and then we can de debate the, the merits of the formulation later. And, uh, but but um, obviously, of course, the formulation was objective, one, <laughs> knowing one, and secondly, Mike didn't go to sleep again. Um, right. I could tell you some more stories about Mike as well at, at lectures, but not, that's, uh, if, I don't have the time. Uh, the other thing, as soon as you do final strain, elastoplasticity, large deformations, you find to get adequate solutions that you have to introduce some level of mesh adaptivity. And um, this is an example of mesh adaptivity. This is a, an experiment. It's an experiment of sand. There's a, a wall here. There's a, along here, there's a, there's a flexible membrane. And uh, what you do is you, you move the wall outwards and you'll see what happens. When it, this, is not the, this is not the mesh. This is the, these are just grid lines for representing the solution. And what you find is, as you 
pull this uh, wall away, then you add fresh layers of sand, but what you see, you have these very complex sets of shear bands developing. And you will never be able to, count, the, not, never able to solve this problem unless you use mesh adaptivity all the way through. And then I'll also show that what we need to do is compare the numerical solutions with the experimental solutions. And I if you put some red lines where the shear bands are, and if you compare this with what happens in the experiment, you see you essentially capture the right behavior. You get this dominant shear band with shear bands coming off there, which you get in the experiment. And you also get these subsidiary shear bands here, which are these here. And, of course, you should point out if you do the experiment twice, you're not going to get the same result in, in, in any case. So I'd like to make the point that as well as solving problems in, with large strains of any complex behavior, you have to do solution validation at all times because all these problems that we're solving, we have no idea very often what the solution should be. So, therefore, you have to use solution validation techniques whenever that is possible. Um, so, as I said, by the early 90s, we could solve these problems. These are some commercial problems that we solved, that I solved. This is a case of contact mechanics. These are hair. This is 10,000 hairs. And with contact between them and different hair products applied to them to give different contact behavior. This is a food can. And it's a, under vacuum loading. And you, you can model the, the whole behavior. This is experiment. This is the real life. This is the making of a plastic container, and this basically, again, you couldn't be, follow this behavior with the same mesh, so therefore you have to do mesh adaptivity all the way through. This is a soap bar, this is a dove soap bar. They originally made it by actually injecting soap in at the top, and what you find is it's as nasty a problem as you can get. You get large deformations uh, and large strains, and also you get a lot of self-contact, and you find that you know, these... Um, bits of soap come into, into contact, and these are sources of cracks, and what they find is that these bars are breaking. So the obvious solution was, of course, was to actually inject from the bottom and withdraw the injector, and therefore you get a very nice bar. And this, uh, these were all done for Unilever. Um, okay, these just show the components that you need to solve these problems. Um, and again, I'll say validation and verification is something that is absolutely crucial for the problems that we're dealing with. Um, also, high-performance computing is important because a lot of these problems are getting too large, and therefore you, also, you need uh, uh, good algorithms in, uh, to solve uh, uh, the, the scale of problems that you need to, uh, to, to uh, come across. And then you have problems with advanced material modeling. This is a case of... Uh, a missile, this is the Im impact of a tungsten projectile onto a, a steel plate, and it's at an oblique angle. And uh, again, this shows what happens, that you, um, the missile penetrates. You can see that it's very complex behavior, and it comes through the other end then, and you get the, uh, a, 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 a cap like that. And again, you would never solve that without mesh adaptivity. So what I'm going to show so now is where we are at the moment. <clears throat> what I've described so far takes us down to this region here that we can solve finer strain plasticity problems. And then from the 90s onwards, other techniques came in. And the techniques I have in mind here are particle methods and multi-fracturing solids. And I've shown those particularly because that's the area that I've been working in. And no lecture on finite elements would be complete with showing the picture of the A to Z of pioneers. And these are John Ajiris, uh, Oleg Zinkevich, and Ray Clough. And this is the last picture of them taken together, which is in Munich in uh, 1999. Uh, okay, so I'm now going to move on to multifracturing solids, starting off with particle methods, and particle methods being discrete element methods. And the only difference um, discrete elements have to find that elements is the fact they're not connected, that all you've got are elements which just make connection through contact in some form between them. And uh, the principal computational issue is contact detection, and if you don't get this right, then you're not, never going to solve a problem, because contact detection is a very time-consuming process. Unless you've got an efficient algorithm, then you will never uh, be able to solve real-scale uh, problems. 
And these are the issues that, first of all, you've got a large number of objects, typically 10,000 to, to, to 100 million, uh, different shapes that they're not necessarily uh, spherical, that they can be any shape that you have. And also, since they're dynamic problems usually, then you usually have to perform this contact detection for a large number of time steps, typically a million. And the, what you do, actually, first of all, you do a global contact search using an approximate geometry, then do contact resolution where you uh, replace the approximate geometry by the real geometry, and then you do the contact modeling. And the, what you do, first of all, then, is to actually take the, whatever object that you have and put a bounding box around it. And the um, advantage of doing that is that the geometry is very simple and it's defined by the coordinates of the lower point and the upper point. And then you need some scheme which says that if you've got n rectangles, then you want to find what other rectangles are in contact with that particular rectangle, and you do that for every one of them. And there are two schemes. One is a tree-based. These are tree-based schemes, different versions of them. And these have a uh, complexity of n log n. Or more efficient, we have the cell-based methods these days, which have linear complexity. In other words, you double the number of particles, you double the, the search speed. And just to show the importance of the contact detection, this is a real problem again. As I said, I, I like to solve real problems. This is a coal conveying system in uh, Queensland, Australia. And this is the model. This is the model of the conveyancing system. And what you have here is half a million elements which have f been fed over, over, from the, over the belt through there. And then you have flipper gate there. It'll, it'll repeat itself now. And what you have to take into account that for every time step of this problem, you have to know what element is in contact with what other elements. And therefore, this brings to uh, it should be clear to you that contact detection algorithms are very important. Um, but that's just particles. What I really want to talk about next is when you start off with a solid and then mo turn that solid into a series of particles. And what approach that we use is a combined continuum discrete representation. And the reason for doing this is that it uh, provides more realistic modeling than trying to do it all as a continuum. And it's essential if you want to know what happens to the particles after they fracture. And the main advantage is that it minimizes the number of material parameters. And more importantly, that these parameters that you can get from laboratory tests. Um, I'm not going to, I don't have time to talk about uh, things in detail, but essentially this is a continuum approach. You can actually use a rotating uh, crack approach in tension complemented by a, a failure model in compression. And the one we actually use is an SR3 model, which is a soft rock model, and this is the relationship here. Um, and then as soon as you detect fracture on a continuum basis, then you insert discrete cracks. And you go to every node, you look at the surrounding elements, and when all the elements surrounding that node have been fully softened, gone down the softening curve, that means the fracture indicator goes from zero to one, then you decide to insert a, a node there. You, you put a crack around that point, uh, as we have here, and then you have to put a, an additional node there, and then you have to locally remesh the problem in order to capture or to describe the, the behavior of that crack. Um, again, I, I, I emphasize the word validation. One of the big, big validation problems in rock mechanics is borehole breakout. What you have is a block of rock with a hole through the center, and we apply different levels of traction stress to it. And what you find is, depending on the material properties and the ratio of stress loading, that you get very different be uh, behaviors in failure. That first of all, Sometimes you will get, for a very hard rock like granite, you'll get failure occurring by spoliation occurring here and here. But for softer rocks, such as limestone, then you'll get a shear banding type of uh, behavior. And uh, yes, you can probably just about see it. This is, emphasizes the material properties that you need, how simple they are. That as well as the elastic properties, all you need are the tensile strength, G sub F, the fracture energy release rate, and the ultimate compressive stress, and also the triaxial data, which is the, the compression, uh, uh, friction angle, and the dilation angle. And these are the material properties that you can get from standard rock tests. 
Um, so this now is the numerical representation of uh, what happens. It's, the, it's loaded, and you can see that, y uh, yes, you can just about see that the fractures occur this place and this place here in mostly vertical direction. And you look at the experiment, then you get exactly the same kind of behavior. And importantly as well, around this region here, if you magnify it, you see that the fractures are in a sub-vertical direction. So basically you get good correspondence between numerics and experiment. Then if you just change the material properties, you don't do anything else, you use the same model, then you find that if you limestone, then the experiment predicts failure by discrete shear banding occurring here and here. And in the uh, um, numerical model, you get exactly the same thing. So you've gone from a behavior like this to a behavior like this, where you get a shear band occurring, which is a shear band made up of um, discrete fractures which co-align or coalesce to form these shear bands. So this is a good indication that you've got a model that is working because it works under all material conditions and by only changing material properties. And if you want any more evidence, there's some here that this is a case of um, uh, sandstone loaded m more in the vertical direction than the horizontal, horizontal direction. This is the behavior you get from the numerical model, <coughs> and this is what you get in experiments. And again, you can see that there's a good correspondence. On the other hand, if you load them equally in vertical and horizontal directions, then what you get are these spiral shear bands occurring. And what happens then, these spiral shear bands sometimes intersect at certain places and the rock drops out. And again, if you look at the experiment, this is precisely what you get, that you get this little triangle falling out, that one falling out, and so on. So again, this is more evidence that you've got a model here that can actually capture what happens in, in rock. Um, right, this is an end-on-impact test very quickly. It's a case of a tungsten projectile hitting a ceramic uh, material, silicon carbide. This is a steel plate at the back. And the reason I wanted to show this one, because this shows what you have to do, that you can start off with a coarse mesh, <coughs> and as the fractures develop, then you have to remesh in order to capture the, the, uh, the crack propagation uh, between elements. So you start off with a coarse mesh, and you end up with a fine mesh here, which actually is a state which captures all of these uh, fractures. Okay, um, this is to show you can do the same thing in three dimensions. This is called Sugano test. This is an experiment of uh, uh, <clears throat> three objects in hitting a reinforced concrete plate. This is the plate here, and we've got steel reinforcement there in a layer, which you have to model by elastoplastic elements. And wh what happens, you can... You can actually impact it. By the way, those three lumps of metal represent the disk systems in the jet engine, the whole idea of a jet engine hitting a, a reactor housing. And uh, what you find is that, first of all, you get a compression wave, travels out, it's reflected as a tensile wave, and you have this spoliation here. And then you can also get a series of concentric rings forming here. And this is the... the um, the deformation of the reinforcement at one stage of the, of, of the, of the process. Um, also, I should say, these, it looks complicated, but this is done on a normal desktop machine. Um, I was going to talk now about, um, that was just simple fracturing materials. But now if you couple these with other uh, phenomena, first of all, if you couple it with gas flow, and I really don't have time to go into the detail, but it basically is a staggered solution procedure where you do a rock analysis and then use a, a fixed Allurian grid to, um, to model the, uh, the, the fluid pressure, the gas detonation, detonation pressure. Some equations are there which said covers the whole thing, and the uh, essential idea is that you have the the, the fracturing rock gives you the uh, directional porosities that you can use the, the crack spacing to give you the directional porosities and from those you can crack the, uh, compute the velocities and so on. Um, this is just a, a, another benchmark test. What you have here is a hole drilled in a rock with an anfo explosive charge applied to the center 
And the only thing I will point out is that the material properties are highly strain rate dependent. That is, you go from strain rate of 1 to a million, you find that the tensile strength goes from 20 to 350. Uh, this is just the case what happens with... This is the, uh, the, the boundary of the block is here, and what you find is you get a compressive stress wave going out, is reflected as a tensile stress, and then they, they get these tensile fractures on the boundary. On the other hand, if you have a non-reflecting boundary, then the wave just goes straight through, and you don't get this uh, behavior on the boundary. Um, this has then been used in uh, commercial problems. You see there are five boreholes here, and there's a 10 millisecond uh, delay in detonation, and we get this kind of fracture pattern. And then also there's another situation here where you get a bench blasting where you, what you're looking for is the spacing and detonation sequences of the, of the explosive so that you can find, first of all, the particle size distribution and also the extent of the, the throw. And I'd also say that these are now commercially used in Australia and the USA. These are used actually to design bench blasting uh, operations. Um, the other thing I should say that modeling rock is never simple. You can't really use, suggest that it's a homogeneous material. So we have what we're going to do here. I don't know. You can maybe be able to see them there. Is that first of all, you have what are called persistent joints, which are very large joints which run through the material. And then between these, you have what are called um, subfabric of veins, smaller fractures. And then between the smaller fractures, you have intact rock. So the process that you have to use is to put in the large fractures directly into the model. Before you analyze it, you put these fractures in there. And then you have to, in the regions in between there, we have the veins of the smaller cracks that you use a tri numerical triaxial cell where you actually put in a random distribution of these um, um, veins and the intact rock and then use these to back calculate the parameters uh, to use in whatever soft, whatever fracture model that you're using. Okay, and then another level of complexity is, is that you've got fluid there as well, because I'm talking about this a rock modeling with fluid flow. And there's what we have here, we have a three field problem that we first of all we've got the solid rock to deal with. And also we've got seepage through the solid rock, so we've got another field there. And also when a fracture occurs, you've got a fluid flow along the fractures. So what you have is a three-field formulation, which you can set up as a, as a UP formulation, where you have the displacement of the rock, or the velocity of the rock, uh, the seepage pressure uh, in the, for seepage flow in the solid, and also you get the pressure distribution throughout the network of, of pipes that you have. And this shows the, the solution. This is just a block of rock. Initial conditions, which is gravity loading and tectonic loading, K0 about a half. And then you're going to excavate this rock in stages. And what you find is that um, when you excavate it, that you find that you get a classical failure. That you, you, first of all, you get movement along the, the joints themselves. And also you get this classical uh, failure slip circle here. Okay, let's move on. Very quickly, I'm not going to go through the complexity of it, but I'm going to talk about vacuum dredging, which is, again, uh, particles immersed in water. And uh, what people don't realize is that half of the, um, the world's diamonds are actually, they don't come from under the ground, they come out, from, out of the sea. That, um, that the, 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 the Orange River runs into the Atlantic Ocean and with large boulders of rock, and um, they settled about 100 meters depth, and the idea that they actually want to collect this rock from the bottom of the boulder size is about one meter. And what you have to do is you have to model uh, fluid and particle flow together. You've got complex particle shapes, and also it's important that you have turbulence modeling. And uh, I, I, I'm just showing here that we're using the lattice Boltzmann method to do this because um, it turns out the lattice Boltzmann method it fits in very well with particle flow because they're both explicit type schemes. And I, I, don't, I don't have time to go through the complexity of this, but uh, I'll only say that, um, that um, 
when I want to model turbulence modeling, I'm always reminded what Heisenberg said. Heisenberg is, of course, the father of uh, quantum mechanics. And he said, before I die, I hope somebody will explain quantum physics to me. After I die, I hope God will explain turbulence to me. And uh, that really shows we still don't really understand turbulence. Uh, so in this model, we are using a very simple model, which is a one-parameter model, and all you will say that it fits into the, uh, the solution quite easily by just adding another uh, relaxation time into the model. And the relaxation time is calculated from the turbulent uh, eddy viscosity, and the eddy viscosity comes from the filtered strain rate tensor. Uh, just to show one example, this is a case of uh, uh, different particles, they're different sided, they're not any particular type, they could be any size poly uh, polygonal particles, and we actually uh, drag these up by applying a pressure difference between the, uh, uh, the surface and, and the region down here, and what we're showing here is the, um, the fluid velocity contours. And I also point out that Re Reynolds' number for this problem is 70,000. So essentially, you have to use turbulence. You're well in the turbulent regime. Um, another example here is an experiment is a, done by De Beers. Basically, they put a load of particles, and they, they suck it up through this pipe. And we model it by um, doing the same thing by using about 5,000 particles, different radius, radii and we, we suck it up here, and again, taking into account particles. Um, experimentally and numerically, experimentally, um, uh, about 1.1 kilograms of material is removed. Numerically, we predict about 1.2, and we get good correspondence between the maximum velocity at the outlet. So what I'm going to show here is just what happened. This is the pipe wall. I'm going to represent this now as a, in an axis. I'm going to average things in the axisymmetric direction, and then we're going to suck this material up there. And what you find is that you get, obviously, depletion here. And what I'm going to show is that uh, computationally, we get this profile. Experimentally, you get this profile. And what you find that uh, here you get depletion down to about 30 millimeters, uh, and, uh, and again about 30 mill millimeters in the experiment, and the extent of depletion is about 100 millimeters, and again about 100 millimeters. So we're getting good uh, correspondence between the numerical predictions and the experimental predictions. Uh, I'll show you one more example, which I shouldn't show, because it's, in fact, it's got nothing to do with plasticity, because the clue is here, it's all reversible. Uh, but essentially, the methodology is exactly the same. That um, we have particles in a carrier fluid, you apply a magnetic field to it, and this magnetic field will actually line up these particles in chains. And then this actually affects the, um, the viscosity behavior, so we can measure that by giving the top surface here a given velocity, and then you can calculate the reactive force, and from the reactive force you can compute the viscosity. And what you find is that you've got a variation between the shear rate and viscosity, which changes depending on the uh, magnetic field intensity that you apply. What I forgot to put on there was that the only additional term that you need in this analysis are the magne magnetic forces on the particles. And these are obtained by integrating the normal component of the Maxwell stress tensor around the boundary of the particle. The Maxwell stress tensor is given by this. Okay. Uh, that's enough of uh, examples. What I will show now are some current and future challenges. That um, virtual design is something that uh, is, is important. Now, we've seen lots of examples already in the first day of the conference of, uh, of these problems. Uh, uh, Javier Oliver showed the, the idea of actually using additive manufacturing. And what we're trying to do is actually doing designing materials and shapes and structure um, by uh, um, changing the material properties and then hopefully uh, building these materials by using additive manufacturing. Multiscale phenomena are a challenge. Uh, you need to bridge scales from the molecular through the atomistic to the continuum uh, model. And the idea here is that you can actually do some, some fundamental material design and also, we need some very large-scale computing capabilities, which have become essential for multi-scale, multi-physics problems. 
Just a quick uh, trip through high-performance computing. Edward Teller, he was a physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project, that is the, uh, the first atomic bomb, um, said that state-of-the-art calculation needs 100 hours of CPU time on any computer independent of the decade. So we, what we're trying to say, we always need expanding computing power. State-of-the-art at the moment are machines like these. This is the IBM Sequoia, and that runs at about 16 petaflops. And we've got the uh, Chinese version, which runs at 124 petaflops. And the problem is, is that you cannot expand the size of the machines without doing anything. Because the problem is, if you want to, to go to exaflop computing, in other words, 1,000 petaflops, that you need to reduce power reduction by at least two orders of magnitude, hopefully three orders of magnitude. And the reason for that is for that this machine here, the IBM Sequoia, it needs 8 megawatts for 16 petaflop performance. And 1 megawatt translates to about a million dollars of electricity per year. So essentially that with the current power consumption for these machines, going towards exaflop computing is not sustainable. So the aim is to deliver exaflop performance at about 20 megawatts. And the Chinese pre uh, predict obtaining the first prototype by 2020 and USA by 2023. But having given you this rundown on the power of computing, I'd like to show you a problem. And that is the rump problem. This is a, a problem posed by Siegfried Rump, who's working for IBM in um, Berlin. And his paper is published here in this, article, in this uh, 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 conference proceedings here. And it's edited by Moore. This is Moore of the Moore's Law fame. And he said, take this function. It's a, quite a simple function. It's a, it's, a, it's a powers of X and Y and one linear division, a linear division in Y, but everything else is just powers. And he says, compute that function for value of X equal to that and Y equal to that. So basically you can do that, sit down there on your, note, on your notepad and write about five lines of code to solve that. And if you try that, what you find is if he was single precision, well, he was, he was working for IBM, so he used an IBM machine on single precision. The answer is 1.17. And then for double precision, you get the same solution with, with a f few more uh, d digits of precision. Now, the only problem is that the exact answer for that problem is minus 0.827. In other words, a computer can't even get the sign right. And the reason for that is that there's a bifurcation in the solution. If you want to get the exact value, you have to use what are called branch and bound methods. Or to put it crudely, high performance computing is not about getting the wrong answer fast. Or, as Richard Hamming, who also worked, he's a mathematician who also worked on the first atomic bomb, he said, and I think this is very important for all of us, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. Okay, let's move on a bit. Um, other areas that uh, future challenge are biomedical applications with many applications everywhere. And I'll show you this picture of, um, this is Oleg Sienkiewicz, who gave a lecture at MIT in 1968, and he finished his lecture with this cartoon here, which he'd drawn. And basically the idea was the finite elements are fun, and he had this uh, man here discretized into finite elements. Now, even Oleg, with all his uh, vision for problems, would never realize that by now that we're actually doing this, that we, we're actually sort of uh, discretizing parts of human bodies, a whole of human bodies, either uh, bone or um, tissue, uh, at, at an ever-increasing level of complexity. Doesn't want to go. Right. Um, the other big area that's predicted for the future is probabilistic methods that we need stochastic approaches to control uncertainty, uncertainty either in uh, material properties or loading. And the problems that happen here that we're looking for the solution to heterogeneous media, microstructure problems, because microstructure is, uh, is very um, uh, um, probabilistic in its, in its um, distribution. And the problem that we face at the moment is problem sizes, because to solve these problems, that these problems, even for very simple problems, are very large in terms of computer demand. 
Uh, these are just some of the areas where we know that we need to make advances. And these actually, I, I didn't take these from now. These are these research directions in computing mecha computational mechanics that were predicted, uh, that were um, anticipated in, nine, in, in the year 2000. And although we're now 17 years into this century, we are making some advances in this direction, but we are not really solving all of these problems, and there'll be plenty of work for the future. And this is a kind of personal remark I'd like to make about research paradigms, that you can either have managed research programs or you can have curiosity-driven research. And managed research programs are usually short-term, and they're usually short-term because you need to define impact a priori, that you need to tell before you make your grant application, you've got to tell them exactly what you're going to get in five years' time. And delivering impact is uh, quite important. It either requires the very active imagination of scientists, and some universities actually employ people to do this, you know, people who write novels, you know, and they, they actually uh, sit down and actually write you a good case of what you can expect in terms of impact. And what this happens here, this leads to development programs rather than research. But on the other hand, they liked very much my funding managers because they're easy to control and to assess. But the question really is, can you define research impact a priori? And there are many examples how eminent researchers have failed to do this. Um, the obvious first guy was Lord Kelvin in 1896, who said, I have not the smallest molecule of faith in aerial navigation other than ballooning. And within 10 years, within a decade, the Wright brothers were already flying. And this carried on. Ernst Mach, who was a professor of physics in Vienna, and he gave his name to the Mach number, he said he got it wrong on both counts. He said, I can accept the theory of relativity as little as I can accept the existence of atoms and other such dogmas. And then atoms were, were found, and... Ernest Rutherford actually talked about splitting the atom, but Rutherford got it wrong as well. He said, the energy produced by the breaking down of an atom is a very poor kind of thing. Anyone who expects a source of power from the transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine. <laughs> so, so again, you get a very eminent person who really can't predict what is going to happen from, from his research. And then, of course, uh, Tom Watson of IBM said in 1943, I can think there's a world market for maybe five computers. And even, and even Bill Gates gets in on the act. He says, in 1984, 64 kilobytes of memory should be enough for any person. <laughs> but the only person who got it really right was Yogi Berra from New York Yankees. He said, it is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so... We can see that sometimes it's very difficult to make predictions about, um, about what the impact of research will be. But on the other hand, there are many examples of unfunded research has led to crucial research progress. Uh, first one I got is uh, Röntgen. Got, he was the first Nobel laureate in 1901 for discovering X-rays, but he wasn't working on X-rays. He was experimenting with cathode rays when he found that plates elsewhere became exposed. Also, cryptology is used for secure communications and, uh, and for banks and military. It's based on prime numbers, and that was Hardy's useless field. He just worked on prime numbers, but there was no obvious application when he's working on them. Albert Einstein also got in the act. He said he was working on improve the general relativity equations, which is useful for GPS, where he improved the precision um, by basically by, by using the, his improvement of Newtonian gravitation. And that, again, he was working on something different, but it's essential for GPS. But the one I also like is Harry Crotto. He's, uh, he's, in, uh, he's in Miami at the moment, working in, in the University of Miami. And he said, I paid my own airfare and in September 1985, carried out the research that resulted in the discovery of the C60 fullerene molecule onto a new field of organic chemistry and onto carbon nanotubes. So he wasn't funded for doing any of this work at all. He did it purely out of his own uh, enjoyment. 
And Andre Geim, who is responsible for developing graphene, also says the same thing. There is no such thing as useless fundamental knowledge. And, uh, and he gives, gives some examples. And then we should also say that the Internet was, came from the fundamental physics research that was carried out at CERN. So we've got examples here of developments that occurred by, by accident, if you like. They, went, they didn't set out to do any of these, uh, these uh, developments. So what we have here, that we need both things, I think, that you need managed programs where it's necessary, but they should be done also with blue sky research. So I think, you know, people who fund uh, uh, research programs should take into account that you need this blue sky research, and these are the, the programs that will produce the step changes that you need for technological progress. I get very close to the end now. Uh, technology lifespans, I could... Uh, waffle on about this for a while, but what you see basically is that um, as we come along, all the ages of technological development are getting shorter. Now, first of all, we have the agricultural age from the beginning of mankind up until about the 1700s. Then we have the industrial age with the development of the steam engine, internal combustion engine. And then about the 1950s, then we get the electronic ages coming in, the first electronic age with the electronic valve, and then the trans. Uh, transistor and then the microprocessor. And what you find is that the technology is developing very much faster these days. And even since my graduation in the early 60s, I've seen all these things developing. And I, there's lots more that uh, has happened since I uh, uh, graduated, no doubt about that. And the whole result of it that these developments take you to a position where you need continuing professional development, CPD that you need to, um, because of the increasing life and work expectancy, that the technology is moving at such a rate that you can't h hope to actually go through your life with the information that you got from your university degree. That continual professional development is essential. And I'll show you this picture here, and I just wonder how well is this... Yeah, that come out okay, I guess. Uh, this is a, um, a painting, and it's a painting in the 14th century... It's uh, Henry of Germany lecturing to students in Bologna. And what you see there, the th first thing that should strike you, there's very little difference to, in the 14th century to what is happening today. You get a lecture there, you get a lot, group of students listening to the lecturer. And it's even more realistic when you look at this guy here, he's even fast asleep. And when professors tell their students to follow their dreams, that's not what they have in mind, actually. <laughs> um, so we, I could spend a whole lecture talking about different ways of uh, pro uh, providing information. And this is uh, something that um, Henya and I worked on in terms of distance learning and so on. But it's also something that's recognized as being necessary. One of the NAE grand challenges, one of the 15 NAE grand challenges that have been said is advanced personalized learning. So I think there, there is a huge area and a lot of work to be done in the way that you actually help people in continuing with, with their, their professional uh, te technology. Right, this is very close to the end now. These are... Well, two young gentlemen, we, well, one young gentleman, you know, Olek, uh, sorry, that's Olek, uh, and that's Eugenio. And this is where he came to Swansea to do his PhD. And, uh, as, well, I, I can go through this very quickly because Eugenio has already said it all. We started a series of courses together and so on. Then we started a series of conferences together, which are still going in one form or another. Com Complast is still going in its present form. A couple of problems now are a series of island hopping problems around the Mediterranean. Particle Methods uh, is now in its fifth edition, three at Barcelona, two in Germany. And uh, the short course activities, which we started off in the early 80s, still is going, that we have a short course attached to the Complus Conference. And this uh, time we had 65 delegates on the course. So it's, a, it's, it's something that is clearly a need for. Also, Simony and uh, Swansea work very closely on research, especially on EU research projects, and we work a lot on industrial forming processes and, as I said, computer-based distance learning, which is uh, the, the kind of thing I alluded to earlier. Um, so, in conclusion, I'll make the obvious statement. 
finite element methods and computational plasticity methods have been remarkably developed over the last 50 years. And probably the next 50 years are just as exciting because there's new technology and new materials happening, uh, be, uh, occurring. And basically, I would say that all of us who work in this total area here should we feel very privileged by the experience we are doing. A, uh, I think we've, it's a really good area to work in. And on a personal point of view, I said that the link between Swansea and Simney is one that I particularly value. And I hope to continue working in this area with Eugenia for the foreseeable future. And then I really leave you with the last slide, which Eugenia has shown almost all of these pictures here already. And they're, as you say, they're the usual suspects in all of them. Um, the one I would like to show you, though, is this gentleman here there. Is, uh, that is Turan Onat, the guy who jumped up and uh, tried to stop Juan's lecture. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's all I need to say.